Um, today we are going to have two different speakers and then we're going to also have um, a moderator for us today. Uh, so we'll start. Jill Chapman, Leah Hayes, and Mike Ogletree are sharing what business owners and leaders need to know about dealing with difficult employees and having tough conversations. This is our 41st installment of the EO Exchange series. Jill Silman Chapman is the Director of Early Talent Programs at Insperity. She has over 25 years experience in the HR and recruiting industry. Prior to Insperity, she worked for both a global enterprise and owned her own staffing business where she led teams, coached leaders, and helped promote many employees to success. She has boardroom experience as well as classroom experience as the instructor at Rice University the, and the University of Hawaii. And I just heard she also has a house in Hawaii. So that's great. Maybe we'll come see you there. Jill has been quoted as a business expert in such media outlets as the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and CBS Market Watch, and has worked with such clients as Marriott, Fox Sports, Monster.com, and HR.com. Fun fact, we heard several from Jill, uh, but the one I'll go with right now was she has her wrestling promoter's license. So if you want more on that, make sure you reach out to Jill. She has some stories I hear she can tell you. Next up, we have Leah Glover Hayes. She is the co-founder and host of Her Story of Success podcast and a business performance advisor at Insperity. Leah is a connector, conversationalist, MC, panel moderator, and business consultant leading conversations panel discussions and webinars with entrepreneurs and business leaders in New York, LA, Philadelphia, and Nashville. Leah has served as a board member of the Tomorrow Fund, the junior board of the YWCA Nashville and Middle Tennessee, the non-board board. She's a big sister of Big Brothers and Big Sisters and was a 2019 Emerging Leader Award finalist. She volunteers and mentors with Future Business Leaders of America, Vanderbilt University's Women Business and CEO. You know we love a fun fact. Her fun fact is Leah was a flight attendant and that really helped prepare her in her business career. She'd love to also share that story with you, so please reach out to Leah. Last but certainly not least, we have Mike Ogletree. Mike has nearly 25 years of management experience, ranging from two-person pre-revenue startups to multi-billion dollar enterprise-sized companies. From supporting over a dozen Applebee's franchises to transitioning to U.S. Food Service, North America's second largest food distributor at the time, onto the next decade. Then in the energy space, he led the build out of the technology, FP&A, and enterprise and commodity risk functions for a $4 billion company. Most recently, Mike was a client of Insperity acting as the CFO for that group of startups. He also was a CEO of his own small business prior to joining the team. Mike's fun fact, he is a big Harry Potter fan and has dressed up as Harry Potter for the last 12 Halloweens. As a reminder, as we get kicked off today, please make sure um, we're all on Zoom. Please make sure to put any questions that you may have in chat. Uh, Leo will be looking for those and um, put them into the panel discussion for you. Uh, so without further ado, let's get started. And Sparity, welcome. Thank you. We're glad to have you here today. Awesome. Thank you. We, appre we appreciate being here for this discussion. Um, so for those of you that are not familiar with um, Insperity, we are a brand new SAP. I think that we were official in January, so it's been fun so far. And the reason that we are doing this conversation is when uh, Mike and I asked for, um, went with forums, um, this is the most requested conversation. So we thought we'd do an exchange for it. Um, if you're not familiar with Insperity, um, we are a... Um, company that was built by an entrepreneur for entrepreneurs. Um, Paul Cervati is still our CEO. Um, when he started Insperity, it's because it was his, I think his third failed business. And he did some reflection. He's like, what is it that... Um, that I'm having issues with that I think all other entrepreneurs are having issues with. And he realized that when, once he started hiring employees, he had a second business of being an employer. And we all know, and in 37 years, it has not gotten any easier to be an employer. Um, so today we serve companies from five employees up to 5,000, um, helping companies uh, reduce employer-related risk, um, offer Fortune 500 level benefits to attract and retain top talent, to compete with bigger companies, um, and help develop our people, develop your people so that you can become more profitable. 
So um, a little bit about Jill and Mike. Um, Jill is the subject matter expert today. She's got all the HR letters behind her name, um, but she's also been in your seat as a business owner. Um, and Mike is really here for his experience share. Um, he has led teams from being a business owner to, like he said, growing, um, being part of a management team, leading a company that went from a few uh, million dollars to about $4 billion in revenue. So he's had a lot of leadership experience. So to kick off our conversation, I kind of want to start with you, Jill. Um, we all know it's gotten a lot harder being a, being a business owner, but also being a leader. Um, and the, the marketplace for employees has changed. Um, and everybody on the call um, has, I think, had their business more than a couple years. And it looks like 35% of them have about 10 to 30 employees. So if you could just start off and just share a little bit about like, what's the climate like today? Why is it harder now to have a good culture and develop people um, than it was maybe even 10 years ago? What's going on today? Yeah, so let's just, let's kind of lay out the landscape of, of where we sit right now as potential uh, as employers. And, and it is changing right underneath our feet, right? The ground is starting to shift again um, from what we were experiencing during the pandemic to this post-pandemic new rules, new normal, new whatever you want to call it. Um, and in addition to that, we've had some economic pressures that we haven't seen in, in quite a few years as well. So during the pandemic and, and even right after the pandemic, we started to see kind of a power shift and the power kind of landing with the employee, right? We started to see demands for, I want flexible work. I want this. I want um, I want that. I want mental health options. I want, I want, I want, I want. And they were getting it, right? We were paying crazy money to people um, to try to entice them to stay or try to attract them to our organization. And we were doing some things in 2022, 21, 22, really what weren't sustainable ideas, right? Um, maybe overpaying to try to attract talent in a way that maybe wouldn't last us um, through the next decade. Well, we've seen a little bit of a shift with some of the economic uh, uh, issues that are that are facing us. And what some of the numbers are telling us is there's a, a little shift on the side of the employees as well. We're watching them not voluntarily turn themselves to go somewhere else or to, to leave an organization to go nowhere just because they're unhappy. They're starting to dig in a little bit more now. And, um, and so to our conversation a little bit later, if we have a problem employee, we may have to be a little bit more aggressive in trying to deal with that because they're not necessarily going to automatically um, leave our organization because they're scared of making the change, right? first in, last out in case things get really, really tight. So um, we're starting to watch the workforce kind of dig in um, and kind of shelter in place a, a little bit more. So those, you know, hashtag great resignation and all of those kinds of trends that we saw um, are, are really starting to um, uh, uh, to change for us as employers. So I just want you to feel a little bit more confident in that maybe your staff has settled a little bit, um, but to our, our conversation that maybe get its own problems, right? Absolutely. One of the most important things in um, the employee engagement aspect is, um, is really in the hiring process. So Mike or Jill, like when you, when you start hiring and you think about having a culture fit and, um, you know, having a great relationship with your employees to make sure that they understand expectations, what's important before we get to the coaching or firing, let's let's talk about the beginning. Um, what's the important piece as you're starting to bring employees on um, to think about the uh, the employee engagement process? Yeah, and I'll touch on one real quick, Jill, and then you can uh, expand. But I think I think about onboarding, right? And especially in big or small businesses, but uh, onboarding, right, is not paperwork. When we think about onboarding, I think there's a lot more that's got to go into it. And especially for, you know, probably everybody on here, but uh, folks who have built a business and have such passion about it, right? Instilling what you have built and that passion into the new people so that they can buy into your vision, right? That's that's your first opportunity. And that really starts 30 days before, right? Onboarding isn't day one. Onboarding starts in the interview process and uh, ensuring that they fit with your vision, right? And and I think as Jill just talked about, 
during COVID, post COVID, you had to throw a lot of money at people to get them. And so culture wasn't the top priority. And now you're, you know, we'll talk later about problems, but that's kind of how you get to problems, right? By not putting the right thing uh, up front being most important. Uh, and you do that during onboarding. Yeah, I think, you know, and, and when I think about attracting people into the organization <laughs> and starting to court them and then take them through those onboarding um, conversations and, and those connections, it's really being able to articulate what is my passion, what is my brand, what is my culture. You know, we have a thing at, at Insperity, we always say it's culture by design or culture by default, because everybody has a culture, right? Um, and what culture is, it's not inside your building. It's how you get things done. It's how you do things around here. What's, you know, what are the norms of my organization? So being able to identify and articulate that in a way that attracts in all your messaging and all the, the things that you, the magnets that you might put out there to attract people into your organization, that they have a clear picture of what that might be so that they can select in or self-select out, right? Because if they're not a match, it's okay. You're not a company for every employee. You're just for the right ones, right? So let them have an opportunity to leave before they even get here, right? Um, if they're not, uh, you know, if they're not speaking the same values or having the same uh, ideals as your organization. So if you can articulate that, um, if you don't recognize what your own culture is, because maybe you can't see the forest for the trees, start talking to your employees and ask them, why did you come here? Why do you stay here? And they'll be able to to give you some words that you can use to begin to, to craft a, a value proposition for future employees and the employees who are there. Because once they get there, you're re-recruiting every day, right? Kind of. Um, and so making sure that everybody understands um, the direction that you're going, why you're doing what it is that you're doing, so that we can all row in the same um, in the same direction. So I love being, that. Yeah, being clear on who you are is important. And I think being clear to bringing people in, being clear about what you expect from them. Um, you ever fall asleep with the TV on? Well, I did last night and I woke up and um, there was a show on. And I think it might have been that Dr. Phil show. I'm not even sure what it was, except because I thought I heard his voice. But they were talking about that hashtag quiet quitting. And they had people fighting about, is that lazy or is that this? Or um, is it that they're just giving you what you're paying them for? But it kind of spoke to me about the idea of expectations, that people need to know what it is mm -hmm. that you expect from them. And that kind of, and if they don't, that's one of the questions that you need to ask yourself if somebody's a difficult employee is because they don't understand really what they're supposed to be doing in the first place, right? But setting those clear expectations, I think, for their roles is, is super important too, as you bring yeah. On that, Jill, with the setting expectations, I know one of the things that, that you teach on is the six boxes. So once you have hired someone, you've onboarded them, can you share the six boxes? And I'll put those in the chat so people can have them if they're taking notes, but will you go through um, what those are once, once they're onboarded? Yeah. So six boxes is a, a, a framework, I guess, um, that is used a lot in performance management. So if you've got any, uh, you know, performance improvement professionals in your life, you may have heard them talking about um, six boxes. And it's really um, an opportunity to understand the influences that are happening to create success for your organization or when you see that there's a rub or that there's a problem. And so this model um, kind of helps you to organize behavioral influences uh, so that you can look at them a little bit closer. And I think Okay, so I'm going to throw a lot of theories at you, but um, so six boxes is one of them, but the five whys, you guys familiar with the idea of five whys, whenever you're trying to, to noodle a problem, you just keep asking why, why, why is that happening? Well, okay, well, why did that happen? Well, why again? And, and if you can ask five why questions, you usually get to the, the root cause, right? And six boxes is kind of another root cause analysis tool, but Here's the six boxes. Um, are the expectations and feedback is one box. And it's like, are the expectations clear to your people? Are they receiving well-articulated feedback uh, on whether they're meeting those expectations? Because we can, we can want to put it on the employee, right? But sometimes maybe we've got a role in, in some 
you know, some of the reasons that they're having a difficult situation or difficult becoming a difficult issue. So expectations and feedback is one. Tools and resources is another box. Do they have the reference materials, the process maps, the templates, the whatever tools that they're using to, um, to work effectively, right? So we need to look at that. Maybe they're disrupting the workplace because we haven't given them the stuff that they need to be successful. And then consequences and incentives. Are the right consequences in place in the event of a performance deficit? Are strong incentives in place for really good performance um, so that we can motivate to exhibit the, the desired behaviors? And then skills and knowledge. Hey, do they have the appropriate skill sets? Do they have the knowledge base to be able to do the job, right? Um, and then the fifth box, I'm trying to do the fifth box is selection and assignment. I do this all the time and you think it would just roll off my tongue. Um, selection and assignment is, um, you know, are they sitting in the right roles? You guys read, you know, Jim Collins, good to great. Are the people in the right seat on, you know, on the bus? Um, but, but that's kind of what we're talking about here. Are they in the right roles? Do they have the capacity to be able to do that job, right? And do it well. And then um, the last box, motivation and preferences. Do they have a positive attitude about the work they're doing? Are they motivated to do their job? And if you peel back into each of those, you may find that maybe I've got something else going on here and it's not just a performance issue, but there's something else at play. And I think that it's a great exercise to, to, to work through, to be able to, to find the root cause for why we're, have, why we're in this situation that we might be in. Love that. Um, let's move into maybe signs of a situation that's brewing. Um, Mike, I know we've talked a lot about this, but can you share a little bit of, um, uh, to your point uh, earlier, Jill, it's like, if you don't address it soon, it's like, oh, my shoulder hurts and you never do anything. And then six months to a year later, you have to have surgery when you could have just gone to PT, right? So like, what are some of the signs um, that we can be watching out for, Mike, to, that starts to show that something's starting to happen? There might be an issue coming up. Yeah, sure. And I, I think it's a good segue, right? From you've done your a lot of the analysis, the six boxes, and you get to a root cause. And we're going to talk about two of those really as the root causes, right? And one is uh, discord between employees, right? So uh, something to look out for. It's a root cause. It's uh, when you think about uh, just your team not getting along, how do you recognize that, right? And what is that about? Is it about style? management style? Is it about culture because you didn't set one and so folks are, are disaligned in the vision? Uh, perhaps it's peer to manager, right? You've promoted somebody and now it's not a good fix. They don't know how to manage, right? I actually don't have the skills and knowledge that Jill was just talking about. Uh, so just looking at discord or things that aren't going well between the team and then tying that back to all the whys and the things Jill talked about. Uh, and then second is, you know, underperformance, kind of an obvious one, right? But how to recognize it, low energy, change in habit, right? A high performer who used to come in at seven, discretionary effort, no longer giving it. Uh, somebody who used to voluntarily come into the office every day, even though it's a remote option, and now they're working from home. Uh, a lot of different things, right, that, that you could think about there. But the big point, I think, is, you know, two things, paying attention, right? So know your people, pay attention to your people, don't get complacent, you know, having to do biz dev and the things that you get tied up to as entrepreneurs, right? We've got to, we've got to generate revenue. We've got to grow. Uh, and we, and we forget to think about the team. Uh, and then two, how are you going to do that today in a remote workforce, right? Uh, finding the right tools and engagement uh, to know that when people aren't in the office, you can't see it. Uh, you don't know if your team has discord when they're fighting with each other over Zoom and and they're not in the office, right? So uh, really paying attention and finding ways to see that in the remote work, you know, remote workforce uh, is what I'd say, think about. You know, you, you, I think when we all logged on, we were like, oh, let's talk about those difficult employees. Let's talk about them, right? Um, but so much of it lands at the feet of our, our leaders. Um, you know, from that idea of the, the setting the expectations and all that sort of thing. But I think really understanding our role as leaders of the organization, we hire people to do things and to get things done. 
not our job. That's their job. Our job is to remove the obstacles so that they can do those things, right? And so in being able to be accessible to your people, to be getting their feedback, to be engaging in just the ebb and flow of conversation, but actually having conversations and listening to what they might be telling you is how you're going to pick up on some of these clues as to whether or not, you know, John and Joe are getting along or, um, you know, you're able to to even observe some of those habits that are starting to change with people. But we've got to stay connected to our people. And so many times we get so locked in on what we're trying to accomplish that we miss the point that we hired people to help us to accomplish those things. We've got to work on the business, not in the business so much. I like that. Um, I want to get into some experience share, um, that you guys have both kind of gone through, um, coaching and also, um, you know, having to let people go, but I want to pose a question to the audience. If anybody has any specific things that they want to ask during this talk, you can do that. We can also do Q and a at the end, but if anything comes up as Mike and Jill are talking and you want to like dig into that specifically, feel free. I'm watching the, um, just put it in the chat. Cause I'm watching that, but, um, Mike, let's move into, okay. You've either got dis discord between employees, um, underperformance, low energy. Um, what are some of the next steps that you can take if you like to help you understand when it's time to coach or, or when to let go? And then we'll get into some experience of, of doing both of those. Yeah. I think one thing I'd touch on, uh, is, you know, don't rush, right. Don't rush the process. We're as owners, as entrepreneurs, we're, we're very quick, I think, or potentially quick to say, this employee's not working out, they gotta go, right? And move on. And that's the easy solution to coach or let go. Let's just jump to let go, right? Because coaching takes time. Uh, and, and I've seen in a couple of cases, right? Personally in food and beverage business, we had a guy uh, struggle for weeks, months, I'm not sure, it was a long time. Uh, didn't let him go. We worked through it. And he ended up being one of the guys we would send to the busiest restaurants in the country to lead the ship. Right. Uh, and we could have lost out on that asset if we hadn't. Uh, other cases, we promoted people too fast and it would have been easy to, to say they're not a good leader. Let's fire them. Right. Instead of, well, we got them in that position. Let's coach. Right. Let's let's see if we can get out of them what we thought we could get out of them. Uh, so. Primarily for me, I'd say don't rush the decision. Don't think too fast about it. Don't move too quick unless it's an obvious no brainer. They're doing some really bad stuff and they got to go. Right. Like an um, ethical issue. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, a couple other quick things Jill touched on, you know, one on ones talking with your people. Uh, you know, have you listened without bias? We go down and sit down in a meeting and we think we already have a preconceived notion of what what this person is, what they're going to bring. Uh, just sit, listen, right? Be quiet and maybe not even respond. Go go sleep on that for a couple of days and try to put yourself in their shoes uh, and think about, as Jill said, is it leadership? Is it, you know, what is the, the root cause uh, of that? Um, and so those are some of the things, you know, over promote I talked about, don't think too quick, listen without bias, uh, right fit, right seat, as Jill mentioned, comes into play there. You may have a great- Let's dig into seat. that. Yeah. I, I, so the, the guy that was in the restaurant that, that he was underperforming and it was like, oh, we should probably let this guy go. What was that process? How did you find out that it's not that he wasn't good enough? It's that he was maybe in the wrong seat. What, 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 what did that look like? He was in the, he was the right fit in the right seat. Okay. It was just training. It was coaching. It was patience, right? Uh, not jumping the gun and getting rid of somebody because it's an easy thing to do. Uh, and so that, that's really where you know, uh, the don't rush, I think is a great example I've experienced in my career. Uh, you know, yeah. So. Jill, do you have any examples of, of when you saw either coaching that helped somebody see that they were in the, the wrong seat? And then when you got them, how, what did that process look like? And what did it look like when they got to the right seat? So I'm going to, I'm going to flip the script just for a second, because Mike is absolutely right. You want to get them into the process, right? Um, and, and, and be working through it and, and not to rush that. But here's the flip side that I see so many times with, uh, with leaders is they don't get it started at all. They mm. think, oh, if I just don't look at it, if I just <laughs> don't pay attention to it, it'll, it'll write itself or it'll take, you know, it, something will work out. And 
I'm ignoring the problem, essentially, right? And what happens when you do that? It just continues to fester. And people are watching you for your reactions to situations. And if you don't get involved, then they're going to say, oh, well, some people here can get away with murder. Some people can do this. Some people can do that. That And, and then it starts to, you know, it starts to ripple throughout the organization. So while you want to be patient with the process, you need to start the process, right? Um, and, and you can't ignore the problem. I, I will tell you, when I had my company, I had a toxic employee. And yet she was my oldest employee. She knew where the bodies were buried, not necessarily my body. It's not like I had a lot of skeletons in the closet, but she knew everything about the, the business, right? She had been there forever. She knew all of our key accounts. She knew this, she knew that, she knew everything. And I was too afraid to let her go because I was like, oh my gosh, I'll never replace it. What about the client relationships? What about this? What about that? And yet she was killing my staff and I was having some turnover because I just wouldn't deal with the problem the way I needed to. Once I finally said, okay, no more, can't go anymore. Um, it was like, I opened all the windows and all the fresh spring air came into the, um, to the office. I saw all of my other employees increase their productivity, increase their commitment level to the organization. And you think that you're so dependent on that person, but you're not, you know? Um, and, and so you can't just continue to ignore the problem because the devil that you know is better than, you know, in your mind than, than what might be on the other side of that, right? I went, I went completely on left, you know, left bank here, but. Um, That's what you do, Jill, but you're really good at it. So it's fine. Um, but I think it's, it's probably, you know, it's something that we all need to think about. Absolutely. Um, we had a question um, in Tennessee. Can we use personality tests to vet application applicants for sp specific positions? Um, if so, do you have any good ones? Um, and so I guess for Jill, you are the HR uh, expert on the thing. So what's the advice that we give when groups want to do personality tests during the application or hiring process? Right. You, you need to be a little you need to be judicious in what you're picking as, as the tool and why you're using it. You know, when you're hiring people, you're putting a big puzzle together, right? You're pulling in information from a lot of different resources. Um, and it could be that assessments are one of those pieces that you want to put in there. But you can never use that assessment as the deciding factor, really. You know, like that's not the thing that you're going to say, oh, hmm, you failed this personality test, so I'm not going to hire you, right? You can't really fail a personality test anyway. It just shows you how much you might have to invest into the individual. Um, but there are some that are specifically meant um, to be used during the pre-employment process. And a lot of them that people will use were never established to be part of the pre-employment process. And so you could be doing yourself a disfavor could be doing the candidate a disfavor, and you could be called on the carpet um, if if it felt like that was your deciding factor because of so many of them. And usually they will they will say, um, we have a, an assessment that we use, um, and uh, it was called Clues Forever, and now I think they call it Personality and Cognitive. And um, what is kind of cool about that assessment is it, it lives with the individual so that how they score, you kind of matrix that against the open role. And you can see, okay, here's the places where I may have to coach up. Here's some places where this person's going to run so far ahead of me that, you know, I, you know, I must catch up because I am their leader. Um, but, um, but it, you know, it helps you with that. And then as you're thinking about promotion opportunities or move opportunity, internal mobility, you can go back and look at that. And again, be able to identify not why you wouldn't hire the person, but where are going to be your moments that you need to invest in this person? And, and you know, it can give you that kind of insight. What was that assessment? What was the assessment it called? Now they just call it personality and cognitive, but CLUES, C-L-U-E-S, and it was all caps. Um, I'm seeing the logo in my head. Um, but, um, that was one that, that we have used, um, uh, predictive index is another, um, that you see out there because, and I, I really kind of like the idea of the predictive index because they're talking about the head, the heart, um, and the briefcase are the people coming with the knowledge and skills. Do they have the heart to do your, 
um, you know, what it is that, that you're looking for. Cause the whole person comes to work, right? You know, right. we'd love it if they left everything at the door, but they don't. Um, and so you got to take into account, um, you know, a lot of different things, right? Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Eric mentions culture index. I mean, there are a ton of them out there, right guys? I can't, um, but, um, but there are a lot of good ones. You just need to be careful that if you're going to invest in one, that it is something that is created as a means for pre-employment um, assessment. Yeah. And I, I would add, I'd add just real quick. I did find success in that, or we did in the energy space uh, as a hiring, Jill said, you know, lining up the role, and you sent, you basically fill it out as what you are looking for in that role. And then you overlay it with the candidates to get an idea of kind of how they fit with that role. Uh, so that's, that's one way we use it. Just never disqualified, as Jill said, right? But an idea of where you would need to coach or catch up. We've been using the Facebook, like Harry Potter sorting houses. And if they're not <laughs> Ravenclaw, we just that's turn them away. So that, <laughs> yeah. but more, but that more, yeah. more hiring oriented than that. I got it. All right. I'm a big takeaway. That's awesome. <laughs> Harry Potter. Uh, that's cute to my heart. Okay. So let's talk about, um, you know, let's talk about coaching and then, uh, letting go. Cause we've got a few more minutes. So what does it look like? So you, you know, that you need to coach someone kind of, what does that process look like? Mike, you want to take it? Uh, yeah, I'll take it. I'll just do a couple and then let you, you fill it in Jill. But, uh, you know, coaching, I think it goes back to, you've done all these assessments, root causes, really, a lot of what we've talked about, right, is really the key to the, the coaching or letting go and dealing with people, right? It's all the pre-work of understanding your folks. And so now we're going to coach, right? So setting setting a clear expectation. We talked about that earlier, right? But it's like smart goals, right? And make sure it's attainable. Make sure that, uh, that it's going to fix the issues, right? That you're not doing all this for nothing, that you really believe and the employee believes on the other side of this, that uh, you know, there's greener pastures, uh, you know, set up a PIP performance improvement plan and monitor it so that there's alignment and clarity. So if things don't go well, that's not a surprise. Uh, and then I, I'd say if you haven't done it yet, right, we talked about these personality index, but uh, DISC is what, you know, we kind of use and, and recommend. And I think it really is helpful. I've seen it in a lot of organizations I've been in. Uh, to do a personality assessment, overlay it with manager and employee and better understand each other um, and how to communicate. And there can be a lot of good value. I had that with a, you know, a employee of mine, if you will, is really my right-hand person. So to your colleague, uh, but we were on the edge of getting along a lot of times. And then we did that and we had a much better relationship. And so that can be a good part of the process of coaching is coaching yourself on how to understand them, right? It's not always about, about coaching the employee, but also coaching yourself. I, the reason I like DISC, we've done that um, in our team, especially if you've got, I mean, all of you do, but you have um, folks that are working with other people in the organization. And for example, the lady that is our administrator uh, for the DISC, she's an S and I'm an ID. So I had to understand that when I'm asking her for something that I need, I have to slow down and change my communication style so that she feels um, that I'm putting her needs first. Right. And I think that that's been really helpful in a team environment. So if you have, you know, if you're one of the folks that have a hundred or 50 employees, you definitely have multiple teams. So having that conversation and that, um, once you do the assessment for everybody, having a, not an event, but like a lunch and learn to go through them all of all four of the personalities and let each person share what they learned about another person and how they might talk about like how, how they might engage with them differently. Cause I think that's a big thing. It's like, if yes, it's good to know yourself, but it's really important to know the people that are on your team. And so if you're having some discord between employees, the disc profile, just so you can learn how to communicate is a game changer for sure. Jill, did you have anything to add on, on coaching the steps? Yeah. So um, while we're talking about the assessment junkie that I am, but um, uh, right now, so we have our interns here this summer and right now they're in a session on core strengths. And I wish that I would have had an opportunity to do something like core strengths when I was starting my career because core strengths not only does like what you guys are talking about by understanding what your 
you know, kind of your your resting face is and, and how you are naturally at your core, but also what triggers you into conflict and what triggers your other people into conflict. And and with this core strengths tool, you can actually like I'm going into a meeting with Leah. I'll put Leah up there. I'll look at me. I'll say, this is what how I need to address Leah in this meeting. This is some of the things I need to watch out for. If Leah starts to do this, then that could, um, I might have, you know, tripped a trigger there. And um, um, I, I think it's so valuable as well. So core strengths, disc, all of these sorts of things. Enneagram, they all have value. Um, it's just kind of what resonates the most with you. But I really like core strengths because of that conflict management piece um, and, and how strong it is in that piece and, and better understanding how you could handle conversations with clients, how you handle, you know, um, yourself and work to an optimum solution. Awesome. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the fun part. What happens when it's mm-hmm. time to let someone go, <laughs> right? We've done the coaching that doesn't work. It's, 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 we've come to the conclusion that it's time to let them go. What do we need to make sure maybe from a HR compliance issue, which I'm going to say, we are not your HR person. Please do not take what we say and use it. Um, you still need to talk to your HR, but what are some of the things Mike and uh, Jill that we need to think about before we let someone go? What's that process look like? Well, I think if you want to, you know, if you want to be as fair in the process as possible, whether it's mandated by regulation or not, you want to take it through its process, right? You want to, you want to see if you are getting any improved and sustained, you know, improved performance. But, um, but there becomes a time when you're like, the investment, you know, the, what did they say? The juice isn't worth the squeeze, the squeeze isn't worth the juice or something like that. But, but at some point you figure out that I, we're, it's just not, it's just not working. productivity stays down, bad behavior gets worse, morale of the whole team. Cause when you're doing this, you're not just thinking about that individual, but you're thinking about that individual's impact on the rest of the organization, uh, you know, more customer complaints and that sort of thing. But I think if you've worked yourself through the process um, that you've given established criteria for improvement, and if you continue to see a failure to meet those, then then it's time to to sever the relationship. I would always say that in that closing conversation with the employee, you just stick to the facts, say what it is, and then be quiet. We're so likely to want to fill in silent gaps. We're so likely to want to, um, um, you know, kind of almost be empathetic, sympathetic, whatever you want to call that with the employee, that that's when we can get ourselves into trouble. We can say things that could, um, that could be used, um, you know, in a way that, that, that wouldn't be right for us. So you want to make sure that when it comes to that final conversation, it's sticking to the facts and get up and walk away, you know, um, uh, kind of thing, but do it in a in a professional and a polite way. Don't let your emotions take over because you still have to maintain that professionalism. And I'm just looking at the economy and the workforce and all this sort of thing. I kind of believe that when we say no to somebody, it's not always no forever. It's no for right now. It's not working in this position, in this moment, in this time. Whatever's going on inside our business and outside in life is not right. So I would always want to to leave it as positive as I possibly can because that person will probably go get another job. The last thing you want them doing is talking bad about your organization, right? Because that could be a potential customer for you or um, potential uh, place that you could find other employees. So you want to be careful about the uh, your brand as you move through this this whole process. Yeah, glass door is a real thing. Um, Mike, do you have? I know you had some like a little bit of a checklist of when it's time to let let someone go. Can you kind of walk through that? Yeah, I think just probably four things we talked about. Uh, just the upfront expectations and things, right? So you know, job descriptions, handbooks, things that are going to protect you, right? You want to make sure that you have you have done those processes and the things we talked about earlier, so that there's there's no uh, I didn't understands and and you weren't clears. Uh, you know, second is they shouldn't be surprised, right? If this is an underperformer who you let go, you should have gone through a process with them, through the performance, through the coaching. Uh, this should not be a surprise to them. And so uh, if it is, you've, you've missed the mark somewhere, right? And exit exit interviews, 
people maybe do or don't do them, but that's a place where you can maybe find out um, if you didn't succeed in your coaching and, and tracking efforts. Last two things I've, I've seen uh, in you know organizations with, with several layoffs is, is it a key person? Have, do you understand the team and have you done a cross training, some recruiting plan? What is your backfill look like to replace this person um, or their work? And how is that going to impact the team, mm. right? Getting rid of somebody can be that breath of fresh air that Jill talked about. Uh, but if it's sudden and unexpected for the team and now they have double the work, uh, you know, there's going to be a morale impact that you maybe aren't thinking about, or they're just best friends with your right-hand person and you blindsided everybody. So uh, don't surprise them, have a plan and think about the team and the morale, right? Before you let them go. Awesome. Thanks. Um, and then any other final thoughts on this before we go to Q and a or break out into our groups? Um, I know one of the things we talked about was once you do let someone go, maybe what's the most important thing afterwards, what's the, what's a good, um, maybe piece of advice or things to think about how to communicate to your team when you have let someone go, what, what, what do you do for the rest of the groups, rest of the people? I'll just take, I mean, for me, clarity. I've seen it not work a lot uh, because management, I mean, I've, many times you find out two weeks later, somebody's gone. Uh, there's this scaredness about folks to, to say we let somebody go. Um, I think over communicate uh, where you can, right? You don't want to get in, into trouble, but um, just be upfront, be honest and, and be immediate so that folks know what's going on. Um, and it doesn't feel like they could be next. People start to worry and stuff yes. like that happens. Absolutely. That's very well said. I don't know that I could add any more to, to Mike's particular comment, but if we're just thinking about how to tie up this whole conversation, um, when you're thinking about having these difficult conversations, again, so many times we we kind of talk ourselves out of having these conversations, trying to push them down the, uh, kick the can down the road. But I think for us, if we can flip the script in our own head about what this conversation is all about, not get all, you know, tied up with, oh, I've got to have this difficult conversation with this difficult employee and think about it like that. But think about it and I've got to have a conversation so that I can get the, the best out of my employees and create the best situation. You've kind of changed the the language that you're using in your own head about the, the positive possibilities of all of this. And it will become something that feels way more fun than having a difficult conversation with a difficult employee, because you can actually think, I can turn this person around. I can affect change in my organization, but it's all in your attitude. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you guys. I think our next step, uh, we're going to go into co 